Morning Church, welcome to our YouTube service. For those of you that have never joined an ENSTB Every Nation Stellenbosch service, welcome. We're so pleased that you can still engage with us online. If you'd like to know more about our family, just visit our website, which is enstb.co.za. And for those of you, just remember that we still have an evening in person. We have two services at the United Church at 4.30 and at 6.30. So if you are comfortable and you are able to join us, please do that. So there's just one announcement this morning, and that is there's going to be a good business breakfast happening on Friday morning, which on the 27th of November. This is really just a time for business leaders, business people, anyone who's got a heart for business or who's in business to come and just have a chat with some people that have really got a heart for business and that really have a heart to see the gospel extend into the business sector. So we will be meeting with a man called Willem Mayer, who is CEO of Campitor. You'll hear more about that on the Friday morning, the 27th. If you'd like to sign up, just look at the WhatsApp bulletin on Monday. And then to those of you that have still been giving through this time, we just want to say thank you so much. As you heard from Diz last week, there's been so many needs in our town in this time that you've really contributed to. So thank you so much. And just remember, you can still give online. The, the little thing, the little um, snap scan will be sent out now. And then lastly, this is our second week of our worship series. And I just want to encourage you as Mark speaks this morning, this is a time when we can engage with the living word. It's not just Mark speaking, but it's actually God's word that is powerful and active in our lives. And my prayer is that as you hear the word this morning, that God would awaken worship inside of you, that you would desire to worship the King of Kings and you would have the tools to know what that looks like. So as we go, I'm just gonna pray over us and trust God to do something really great in us this morning. So Father, thank you so much that you have called us, you've created us to worship you. And I pray that as we hear your word this morning, you would awaken worship inside of us, that there would be a desire to praise your name, to praise your holy name. I pray for a blessing over every person that is watching this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Kate. Good morning, church. It is so good to be with you today. I trust that you're going to be blessed as we dive into God's Word. My prayer for us, which I really truly believe reflects the heart of the Father towards you, is that as a church, we would grow in our devotion to Him, in our worship, and our love for God. This is an area I really believe that God wants us to dive into. And that is why we're doing this series called On, on Worship, that we would get some uh, some keys and some skills and some knowledge and some understanding of what it means to truly worship the Father. I want to dive in this morning. I want to read to you John 4, verse 23. It says, Jesus speaking, says, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. See, church, there's a type of a worshiper that the Father seeks. There's, there's true worshipers, which means there's false worshipers. And this is what God is doing around the earth. He's looking not to see um, who's the most charismatic leader or the best communicator or the best of the best or the most rich or the one of the most Instagram followers. What God is looking throughout the world right now is He's looking for worshipers, people that understand Him, that get a glimpse of Him and are reflecting that back to Him. Now, 
Uh, if you're kind of like me and you don't have the best world uh, voice in the world, you might be thinking, man, I'm not a worshiper. Uh, where does this leave me? I've got good news. All of us can be worshippers before the Lord because worship is showing that which is valuable towards us. It's showing um, what is worthy towards us, expressing that which is significant in our lives. And all of us can be worshippers. And that is really what God's heart is for each one of us. Worship is a reflection of who we think God is. When we come on a Sunday to church and we have corporate worship, what we're doing is that no matter what's happened in the week, or maybe the celebrations we've had in a week, we're coming in that moment together. And we're saying, Father, according to who you are and how I see you and how great you are and how good you are and just how amazing you are, I want to express my thankfulness and my gratitude for who you are. It's a reflection on who God is. That's why it's so important that it's not just the words we say, but our hearts really do matter. In Matthew 15, verse 8 and 9, Jesus is kind of quoting Isaiah when he says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce. See, church, if our hearts are not in our worship, it doesn't mean anything. It's like when we go to celebrate um, maybe your favorite sports team and you're in the stadium and maybe they score a try and they score an amazing try and South Africa wins the World Cup and you're like sitting on your chair going, you're clapping, but your heart's not in it. I mean, do you remember just over a year ago when the Springboks won that World Cup title? We were jumping up and down. We were celebrating because of something that took place. That is a moment of worship. Now, that's not worshiping uh, something that is ultimate and something that, 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 that is eternally good. But when we get a glimpse of God, we realize that God is better. God is greater. That there's nobody like Him. And when we get a glimpse of His nature and His character, we cannot help but worship. A.W. Tozer said this. He said, the most important thing that us as humans can do is to think of who God is. Because the more you think of God, you, get a, you realize He's merciful and He's kind and He's gracious and He's compassionate and He's loving and He's, and he's just all at the same time. That He knows all and He's all wisdom and He's all might and He's all powerful. When we think about Him and we realize that this great God paid the ultimate price that I could be reconciled back to him when there was absolutely no ways that I could do it. <laughs> it leaves me just with one response, and that's to worship. And that's to say, Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. How good, how great, and how good you are to me. So I'm going to give you a key today, which, da which comes from David in Psalm 145. And this is a key that I believe is going to motivate your hearts. Uh, motivate your hearts to worship him, to know God. That's what I want you to, to take away from today. I've entitled my message, Growing in His Unsearchable Greatness. So here's David, Psalm 145. David writes this now towards the end of his life. He's in his late 60s. Uh, we know that he died probably about 69 or 70 years old. People are helping him. He's really getting old. But at this time, he pens the psalm. And it caused something to well up inside of us. We realized how good is our God. David knew something. There was an anchor to his soul and a motivation for his worship. This is the key that I want to give to you today. And the key is how great is our God. See, I want to read with, read with me actually. Uh, verse 1, Psalm 145. First three verses say this. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. Great is God and therefore He is worthy of our praise. His greatness is unsearchable. In other words, you can't fully know it. You can't fully get there. You can, you can try and we can put all our heads together and all our hearts together and still then it'll, it won't be sufficient enough to tell us how great our God is. 
This is what David is wanting us to understand here. How great and how good this God. And if you look back at his life, he had some highs, some lows, some ups, some downs, some good choices, some bad choices, things that he wished that he'd never done. The other things he would have been grateful that he did. And yet through everything, he says, I want to remind you of the unsearchable greatness of our God that we have the privilege of serving. He starts and he says, um, well, let me, before I go there, I'll say, church, we are hardwired to worship something. It's built into our DNA as people. When somebody does something great, or whether it's a rugby team or sports team, or your child does something, we can't help but celebrate when, something, when somebody does something great. In fact, um, I read this week, uh, somebody said, it is impossible for us not to worship. You cannot not worship, okay? Because it's gr- ingrained inside of us. We want to know who's the goat, okay? The, if you don't know what a goat is, it's the greatest of all time, okay? Or Ton always wants to know, is it, is it Federer or is it uh, uh, um, uh, Rafael Nadal? That took me a while to get this. It must be actually Federer who's the, who's the one. But if you, we want to know who's the greatest. Who's the greatest tennis player? Who's the greatest rugby player? Who's the fastest athlete? You know, who's the cleverest? Who's the brightest? Who's the smartest? We want to give awards. We want to celebrate when somebody does something remarkable. It's, it's part of who we are. And as humans, we are designed to enjoy greatness. We are designed to enjoy the greatness of God. And this is what David wants us to get. He wants us to see God's greatness so that we can be changed in the process. See, church, we are created to know Him, to celebrate Him, to rejoice, um, to be captivated, to be enthralled, to be exhilarated by this great God. That's how God has wired us. And that's what David is trying to help us to get in the psalm. He's saying, just before you jump ahead, remember this, the greatness of God. He starts off in verse 1, and he says, I will. He's making a commitment here to praise. He's saying, I will, no matter what, I am going to worship. I am going to praise. I'm going to give God my best. I will. He says, I will extol you. Do you know that that word extol, we sometimes think it means to be lifted high, but it actually means to be high, okay? Because you can't lift God up. He's already up. He's already high. He's already exalted. He's always there. He's always in that place. We are just acknowledging the fact that He is in that place. So when we extol God, when we lift Him up, we're saying the things in our life that have come to try and steal and captivate our heart and the wrestle that we have in this life where things are trying to vie for our attention and and to get our heart. It's all those things that are trying to come against us. And we're saying, God, irrespective of what I'm going through in my life, what is trying to ever captivate my attention, you, Lord, are first. You are lifted high. I'm lifting you up above all other things and other relationships in my life because you are most beautiful, because you are most great. In fact, you're the one who can truly satisfy where nothing else can satisfy. That's what it means to to extol in that way. See, friends, the challenge that we have is that whatever we magnify has the potential to influence our day. When we magnify our strains and our struggles and what we're going through, then that's what impacts us. When we magnify God, we allow His voice to define who we are. David goes on to say, I bless the Lord. He chooses to bow down low, to submit to the Lord. He chooses to give everything that he's got with his words, just to bless the Lord, to speak of his goodness. And then in verse 3, it almost like repeats itself. It says, Lord, you're great, and you're you know, greatly to be praised, and your greatness is unsearchable because nobody gets close to you. And then David goes in, and he mentions three things that I wanted you to take home today that I believe are going to ignite a worship inside of you. The first one, God is great in his deeds. I want to read verse 4 to 7. It says, One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Here, David's kind of trying to use every word he can muster to tell you about how great this God is. He's saying mighty acts, wondrous works, awesome deeds, abundant goodness, everything he's got. 
as if we were in Stellenbosch and we live in a beautiful town. He's saying, look up to the mountains, look what's around you. This is great, but there's something even greater. The one who made those mountains, the one who created that environment, the one who created that experience, that who God is, he is greater. Church, God is so great that you know that he measures all of the waters in this earth in the palm of his hand. Isaiah 40 verse 12, it tells us that he measures the breadth of the universe from one side of his palm to the other. 46 billion light years he literally measures in his hands. Do you know how great he is? And it's due to the, um, and all of this, he just literally spoke into being. That's how great he is. He, he, He did that. And with his fingers, he created the universe, and he measures them out. And what's amazing, with 46 billion light years, God knows us in detail. On your screen, there's probably going to be a picture of, of the uh, Andromeda galaxy. For those of you who don't know that we are here in what they call the Milky Way galaxy, and two and a half billion light years away is another kind of like pretty small galaxy. Well, at least on the pictures, it looks small. But that tiny galaxy, which is the closest to the Milky Way, has 10 billion suns in it, what, uh, over, uh, um, uh, over a trillion stars are just in that tiny galaxy. And God knows every single one of them by name. Church, do you know how big our universe is? How glorious our universe is? I mean, Psalm 8 verse 3 says, Consider the heavens and the works of your fingers. How great is our God to create such expanse, something so magnificent. And I love this. I can imagine the angels worshiping in heaven. I mean, they are, their eyes closed. They're singing, holy, holy, holy. They they're keeping themselves just like afloat, and then they get a glimpse of the Father, and they worship again. And then in Hebrews tells us that one of the angels says this, What is man that you are mindful of him? In the midst of this huge universe, this tiny little place over here, this little Milky Way galaxy, this, this speck of dirt which looks like in the middle of nowhere, how come your attention, your attention, is on those people? What is man that you are mindful of them, that they are so special to you? Church, our God has created so much, created you in his image to have relationship with you, to be his crown and to be his glory and to be the one that he wants to pursue. How privileged are we to know him? Amen. Scripture says that he folds up the heavens like a garment. Can you imagine that? You know, somebody so big, that he's just holding. We can hardly get our minds around. That's how great our God is. So David reminds us that God is great in his deeds, what he's done. I can imagine David looking back on his life and saying, God, you helped me there. You came through there. You did miracles there. You came through. You're great in your deeds. Secondly, he says, you're great in your disposition. That is his nature, his attributes. See, our character can go up and down, but God's attributes are unchanging. Verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Church, do you realize that God doesn't change? It's not like he's on a a spectrum of mercy over here and, and grace over here and maybe justice over here and some days he's a bit over this side and some days he's here. No, no. All the time he's gracious, all the time he's merciful, all the time he's holy, all the time he's loving, all the time he's compassionate, all the time he's knowing, all the time he's full of justice. That's who he is. He's all of these things, all at the same time. And that tells us at the end of our life, the decisions that God has made will be right and will be true and will be just and will be good and we will have and, and we, w- we won't be able to question any of those decisions because it's come out of his love, which is right all the time. See, friends, verse 14, verse 16, verse 18, and verse 19 tell us uh, just some amazing things about God being so powerful, yet so personal. That this God, who created the heavens and the earth, who, who wants to come through for us, verse 14 says, The Lord upholds all those who fall and raises us up those who are bowed down low. Verse 16 says, 
You open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all His ways and kind in all His works. The Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. This powerful, almighty God has chosen to reveal Himself, not as the only wise one and the protector and the provider, but He's chosen to do those things, but to reveal Himself as a Father, as a Father who's approachable, as a Father who loves their children, even when their children don't know what they're doing. Jesus came to reveal the Father. Friends, I don't know about you, but this gives me so much great hope that this all-powerful, majestic being who is God has chosen to come and relate to us as a father, a father who is strong and can do something about it. The third thing that David says, I'm going to close with this, is that David says God is great in his dominion. In verse 10 to 13, it says, All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of your glory and your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures forever. Church, what I love about God is that we truly can trust Him. We can truly rely upon Him both now and for eternity because His kingdom is not going to fade away. At the moment, if you've looked in the news for the last few weeks, you've heard about Donald Trump and uh, um, uh, President Biden, and there has been who's going to win, and it's consumed the news. In a few years' time, every single president, their reign comes to an end. But the one who doesn't sits on the throne for all eternity, and that is our God and our King. That means that when we put our hope in Him, we put our, we're putting our trust and our security in that which will never be taken away. That is the confidence that we have. Church, if I look at Scripture and I look at the people that have seen God, their response is literally to bow down, to fall on their face, to be humbled, to, be, to almost be, feel unworthy when we compare ourselves to Him. We cannot get into the Lord's presence if it wasn't for the sacrifice of our great King, Jesus Christ, we would be obliterated because He is so holy and so bright and so powerful. Yet Jesus has made a way, whether it's, um, you know, Peter, or whether it's David, or whether it's Isaiah, they fall on their, fall on their face, and their only response is, Lord, here I am, send me. Here I am, how can I respond? There, there, there has to be a response when you've seen how great God is. Lord, I want to go. I want to tell. I want to speak. I want to do. It's impossible to see something so, somebody so beautiful and not there be an overflow. The gospel demands an action. Let us be a church that goes. Let us be a church that speaks. Let us be a church who understands a bit about the greatness of our God and our King. In verse 19, David goes on to say, he kind of reminds us about um, the fear of the Lord. He says, He fulfills the desires of those who fear Him. He also hears the cry and saves them. We see here also from, from Scripture, there's like a, a change of gears in verse 20, and he says, But the Lord preserves all who love Him, but the wicked He will destroy. You're like, hold on, where's David coming from? He's just telling us about the greatness of God, and then he's reminding us that he's going to take out the wicked. What David's trying to get us to understand is when we understand the justice in this and the holiness of God, then we don't become familiar with Him. In fact, you will appreciate the love of God even more when you understand the justice of God. It's a better appreciation. I don't get familiar with God. Yeah, He's got to love me. He's got to come through for me. No, when I realize that I am nothing without Him and that I deserved something terrible, and He gave me that which was great. I'm left to respond to Him in all. In verse 21, he says, My mouth will speak the praises of the Lord, and let all flesh bless His holy name forever and ever. Our response has to be, God, you're worthy of all praise. I can't tell you the times when I look back and break through in my own life. It's been those moments when I've just been singing to Him at home, 
in the car, in church, where I take my eyes off circumstances that I feel are big and important and, and uh, demand my attention. But when I've just looked up long enough to, to remind myself who he is and that he's able to come through. And if he does or if he doesn't, he's still good and he's great and he's worthy to be praised. That's when I've seen God just do amazing things. Family, we're going to have a, a moment of worship. But I want to read Hebrews 12, verse 28 to 29 to you. How do we worship? How do we respond to the greatness of God? We respond in awe. It's one of the ways that we respond in worship. It says this. I love what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let us worship God acceptably, thanksgiving, and with reverence and awe. Not to get familiar with, but this great and almighty and powerful, loving Father. Psalm 95. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord and the Maker of heaven. Whether it's the wise men bowing down before Jesus, or Simon Peter, or Isaiah, or John, whoever, one day, every knee, every tribe will bow down to our great God and King. Every person will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Church, when we look at God, we are overcome, we are overwhelmed, and we are overflowing with gratitude because of who He is. I'm going to pray for you. We're going to take a time, just wherever you might be, at home, on the couch, uh, somewhere with your family. Why don't you find a posture that reflects your heart. And let's thank Him for who He truly is. Amen. Father, I pray for every person listening. I thank You that You are great in their lives. Lord, we choose today to take our eyes off our things and we remind ourselves of Your goodness and Your greatness and that You are more for us than anything we can imagine. Thank You for Your love and for Your life. Thank You for Your mercy. Thank You, Father, for Your compassion towards us. Lord, we speak I speak just your favor and your blessing over each person. Would you reveal yourself to them today in new ways? In Jesus' name, amen. Family, be blessed and enjoy your worship today. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring life to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are you lord you give life you are love you bring life darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are you Lord great are you Lord great Great are you. And great.
Great. 